Welcome, travelers. You've found the storytelling room of Cosmic Roots and Eldritch Shores. Get yourself a cup of your favorite brew, settle in, and get ready for takeoff. Tonight, we have The Witching Hour, a story by Kweki Yogen Echowe from our Meet Legends and Fairy Tale Department. I stood, balanced at the top of the oldest palm tree, the one that grew at the south end of the village. I was in my element, pitch black night. This was my dawn, the murmur of glowing spirit mixed with the chitter of living insects. The hoot of an hour reminded me there was work to be done, battles to be fought, silent, undeclared, but raging all the same. An old mama Ishaka was on the other side of them. With a sigh, I leapt from the tree, fell free and caught one of the power lines that led to a human spirit. The link was strong. The call of this spirit sang the music of its soul to me. It called me back home. We sat in my hut, bare as it was, Ejira and I on the even bearer floor. The kerosene lamp hung from a nail in the wall. Its flickering yellow light are only illumination. I didn't need much, being a creature of the night. I had chosen my apprentice for her goodness. Shy and quiet, she was my sister's child. Like other old world witches, I was glad to recruit from family, where they were caught closest to us. Blood was more than just a symbol. She was still learning to maneuver the delicate currents of the other side. I rubbed the Ori ointment on her eyes to ease the transition and make visible the other realm. The beauty of it along with the denizens that drive normals mad with fright. We moved freely among it all. The souls of sleeping humans, shining shapeshifters, headless spirit drifting along upside down. I took hold of her hands and invoked the deep black sleep that let us travel to the other side. Our bodies slumped and we passed over. We floated, translucent and unbound by gravity. We had power in this state, a power that was intoxicating. Ejiro moved towards the door. I smiled and pulled her towards the wall. I flowed through it and she followed. Outside the protection of my hut, we felt the pool, the dreams, the thoughts of sleeping normals. Those souls connected to us pulled the most, sending out strong lines of power. There was one we set out to find. I had established a connection with her in the physical world and could see her soul cord faintly shimmering. We flowed along it, shifting ships. I an old brown oil, Ejiro in Niger. We sailed swift and sure, alighting on a palm tree beside a dark in the house. I shifted back and floated to the roof. My fledgling followed. We sifted down through the thatch. I looked at Ejiro. She nodded and threw a shroud over the home's sleeping occupants to keep them still until our work was done. She fastened on their sleeping forms and they choked, gulping for air, struggling vainly to wake. In the morning, they would say they had been depressed and they would shiver. I drew close to the one who were here to help, a girl of eleven. She tossed and turned, feeling the energy of the other side but unable to wake to it. I slipped my hand into her chest and cradled the pulsing spirit heart of her being. She gasped. I gathered my energy and pulled. Her body convulsed and she held back, frightened at the pull to cross over. Though this crossing was only a hair's breadth way, not the far away world of the ancestors. I pulled again. Her body heaved its hold on her loosening. Again I pulled, and the body's grasp slipped away. Her translucent spirit form came away. Initiation. The newly freed form floated gently, looking at us curiously. My spirit energy was depleted, a danger especially as I rarely fed on others. I glanced at Ejiro. She was flush and glowing faintly, 
without intention, having drained energy from those she subdued. She had not yet mastered the art of fastening and holding without feeding. She started guiltily. We sifted up through the thatch, leaving the newly awakened one floating quietly about the house. She would explore the new realm we had opened her to. Before a coven found her, we would be back to teach her and bring her into the fold. We flew on, Oal and Ninja. We awakened other young ones. Each time I was left weaker. Each run intentionally drank in life energy and spirit consciousness. If she drained too much, their spirit flame would be extinguished and they would die. But as a teacher, the guilt would be mine. Dawn was near and we were far from our bodies. We could not survive long here without the clear spiritual focus the night imbued us with. Weak and tired, I set a course for home. We glided along the spirit current. I didn't notice I was falling until I hit the ground and rolled roughly. The ninja alighted beside me, shifting into the shape of a wild cat and picking me up in her jaws. She could so easily have crushed me leaving my contorted body bereft of spirit, but she bore me safely home. I slept for two days, waking only to gulp down water and a morsel of food. I woke in my hut, a blanket covered me. Beside my mat was a cup of water and food covered in a clay bowl. The hut was swept and arranged. I smiled. Adriel took great care of me. I took a long pool of water. Though I wondered sometimes at the rightness of what I did, if I was any better than those who battled, Ejiro did not doubt. Perhaps I could trust the innocence and goodness of her heart if I couldn't trust my own. I stretched and got up. I had business to be about. My small farm did not tend itself. We had day work. Like everyone else, we needed to survive in the physical world. This was why Ejiro was with me. Although my sister thought her daughter helped me tend my farm, well, she did. She just also helped me cultivate souls. Ejira had gone to her food stall in the marketplace. The market was a good place for recruiting, and mothers often warned their young ones not to touch or take anything from strangers, but recruiting mostly came through relatives. Every young child had a tendency towards the spirit realm that waned as they grew and got more settled in the physical world. But giving them food saturated with the substance of the other side strengthened the connection and in sleep the spirit strove to break free from its body and rejoin its natural home. Often the help of an initiating witch such as myself was needed. I wondered sometimes if it was right, taking them this young without their consent, as I had been taken by Mama Ishaka. She had been a family friend. She liked her recruits, sweet and kind and young. So did I. But her motives were as different as palm oil from granite oil. You could fry with both, but only one was good for yams. The old one exulted in corrupting innocent apprentices Wapping them into bloodthirsty hags who fared for the pure joy of the misery they inflicted. Witches like Mama Ishaka had a craving for evil, came to it of their own strong iron will. Such ones allied themselves with like minded Dibias and medicine men, prophets and healers, the strongest of the other siders. They lived in both sides and with a keen balance assessed either at times and ways that made us feel like normals. The dark Dibia sometimes sent their witch allies to carry out assassinations and other such work. My time with Mama Ishaka had left me prey to the pool of their ways. Another hunt, a night for Ejiro to train in practices of power skills to help turn the tide in a silent battle. I let out a hood to signal the hunt start, sending shivers through the spines of any beings still awake, setting them praying. We sailed through the night in our favorite forms, Oal and Nightjar. We could take any shape we conjured, 
But the more time in one form, the more powerful we grew within it. I led the way, swerving to avoid the cups of trees, a coven's meeting place, surrounded by his cloaking the coven's activities from other creatures and night users, prophets, healers, even worshippers of the white Christ. They each followed their gods or god and drew power from the other side. Just power. Like a knife, it was what you did with it that mattered. But I knew what many did with their power. The nine jars call drew me out of my thoughts. We had arrived at our first stop. We perched atop a mango tree beside the house. Normals knew a tree beside one's house might bring hauntings and creatures of the night. I led the Juru through the art called Sendings. She fed to the point where the soul's hold was tenuous, at the cost between life and death, and I helped her establish a spiritual connection to see this person's life threats and move them gently, guiding their fate and fortune to their benefit in the waking world. The one who turned me, Mama Ishaka, she taught me this, but she gave those she haunted terrible sendings, tortured them with nightmares and visions. Sometimes she toyed with them, gave them helpful sendings they came to trust, imagining them from ancestors or kind spirits. Then she sent visions, pulling her victims down to ruin and death. And so witches and dreams were feared. She did not always take the time to be this creative. She might simply feed until their heart gave out or their organs failed. The more one fed, the more powerful one became, seen further into the future, taking the shape of more powerful beasts, influencing people and events more, living longer. So some of our oldest witches radiated the powerful malevolence. Mama Ishaka took immense pleasure in corrupting her apprentices, whom she chose from amongst the goodliest and kindest hearted. These were the ones she enjoyed breaking, pulling the gold from their souls. On our hauntings, she pushed me to feed until our query's life force gave out. But I would not. I was the most difficult one to corrupt, you would say, then cackle and fly off in search of our next victim. But feeding is addictive and my craving grew. She was a patient one. She knew it was just a matter of time. Earning my freedom would require giving in to that which I hated and feeding until the victim died. But this owl outplayed her twice over. When I saw souls in difficulty, as I had their life threads stretched before me, glowing white lines leading towards good, darkened lines pulling them towards misery and ignominious disease, I went down their white threads through a cascade of images and gave them positive sendings, visions and warnings for the future. I set many on a safe path out of the claws of Mama Ishaka. And from another witch, I learned a second way to end my freedom, wake a new witch, create my own apprentice. Mama Ishaka had been enriched and tormented the one who taught me this. So age and I followed power lines, sailing swift and sure, agents of the night, searching out the wretched of the earth, the ones that most needed good in their lives, and provided them this while feeding, an unholy exchange, rendering help to those alien ones, through power, feared, and known only for misery and death. Eventually dawn neared and we needed to return to our bodies to cross the veil back to the world of normals. We flew for home and into an ambush. The ninth jar was pounced upon and sent careening off to slam against a tree. I was held fast in the strands of another side web, a spider's web, large and thick enough to hold a goat. Only an old witch with much power could do this and there was something familiar about that aura. The spider dropped down before me, its huge head twisting and writing into the shape of a human face. It was she, the one who had initiated me, opened me to the other side. 
Mama Ishaka. She swung around me, cackling, hanging upside down with her full glare on me. Even with a human face, her maw was rich with venom that flew out, scarding and burning me. I would wake sick and wounded if I woke at all. She longed for my throat and pulled back, toying with me. Then she held her pincers to my head, and in that sharp vice, a tunnel of dark visions and memories swallowed me. Her memories of people, they looked familiar. I stared. They were the people I had helped while her apprentice, but she had found me out and carried out her revenge, tormenting and killing them. She laughed, shrill and mocking. She had undone all I had devoted myself to, all that allowed me to live with the evil I felt inside me. My anger was a fire. I tore free of the vision. She slid a claw down my cheek, telling me that now she was content to finally let me go. Or, she said, maybe I'll stay close, watch you save spirits, watch them flourish, then pull them apart, rip them to pieces. A crooked smile laced her face and she turned to sidle up her web. But the old one made a huge mistake that night. Perhaps to her goodliness only meant weakness. Perhaps she underestimated the value of those souls to me, underestimated the power of my rage, failed to see that I might freely do what all her power had never forced me to do. I struggled in her web of body and heart and mind, and broke free as a lion, fangs, claws, wings, power. I shredded her strands like Guzama. She turned to face me and I leapt upon her, my claws tore into her as she tried to transform, tried to cast me off, but I held fast, held tight with the power of my hate, my grief, my love for what she had destroyed. Eventually, she fell still. I felt the tremors from her body dying in the physical world. Her spirit form floated away and came apart, dark dust in the wind of the nether realm. I shrank down into an old sad oal and flew to my wounded apprentice. I transformed and cradled the small body. I wept. I had lost myself and everything I had tried to build. The old one had triumphed. She had made me what she wanted in the end. I had run away from dead dealing all my life, never knowing I was running towards it. I wept. Ajiro's broken body in my hands. My hated enemy regrettably dead and the dawn closing in on me. One could be a certain thing, but not be bound by it so long as one never gave up fighting it. I would keep fighting this thing I was, this evil Mama Ishaka saw in me that she tried so hard to make me live out. Evil never wins until you stop fighting it. Ejiro survived that night. I recovered my heart and resolve. We stood at the top of the oldest palm tree in the village. The night was alive around us, two realms open to us. I meant for us to change things, two women, one almost too old, the other maybe too young and inexperienced, two witches against the world, the set way of things. We were all there was, and if we failed, it wouldn't be for lack of trying. My apprentice looked to me. Perhaps good can never win, I said. But maybe evil not winning is enough. Enough to keep us going each day. I will train a kid out of good witches. You are the first. Ejiro nodded and without prompting we leapt off, following the call of souls, connecting to the lines of power, soaring into the living blackness to carry out a dark goodness.
thanks for joining us on the journey. We'll see you next time.